Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, my webinar. I'm Jim Gordon, founder and executive director of the Center for Mind Body Medicine, and it's uh, great to be with you. And it's especially good today to be with Ajua Ayatoro, an old friend, well, a friend, a longtime friend, longtime friend, uh, who is with me at a really important turning point in history, which we're going to be talking about. Uh, as we talk about a number of issues which have been of concern to her in her uh, many, many years of work for civil rights and reparations and justice in the United States. So before we begin, once again, welcome, Ajua. Let's Thank take you. a couple minutes to do some slow, deep, soft belly breathing, everyone. Just to remember, we do this at the beginning of the webinars, sitting comfortably, perhaps with our eyes closed to remove external stimulation and breathing deeply in through the nose and out through the mouth with our bellies soft and relaxed. Relaxing a little more with each exhalation. Remember, this is a concentrative meditation. So we're concentrating on the breath coming in through the nose and out through the mouth, on our bellies being soft and relaxed, and on the word soft as we breathe in and belly as we breathe out. bringing ourselves into physiological and psychological balance as we breathe slowly and deeply. Creating a state of awareness, relaxed awareness, presence, allowing our minds and hearts to open If thoughts come, let them come, notice them, let them go. Gently bring your mind back to soft belly. Couple more slow, deep, soft belly breaths. Okay, let's open our eyes. Let our attention come back into the room. Ah. So, Ajua, once again, welcome. We haven't seen each other in, in, a, in a couple of years. So yeah. It's great to see you. You look wonderful. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Ajua is a very distinguished professor emeritus of law. She's been a um, civil rights attorney and civil rights advocate for many years. She was a social worker as well. That's an interesting combination. Somebody who is uh, deeply knowledgeable about both mind-body approaches, civil rights, and the law. Uh, she's worked very closely with national organizations, black lawyers, 
and also with the Congressional Black Caucus. And a major focus of that work has been on reparations. And that's where I'd like to begin. We're going to have a conversation touching on many of the important events that are happening within us and around us, even as we're speaking here. But Ajwa, this morning you said you were watching a markup of a bill in the House of Representatives, U.S. House of Representatives, about reparations. Do you want to, which must be an incredibly exciting moment for you to see things moving ahead. Do you want to talk a little bit about what reparations are, what brought you to becoming so interested in them, and, and why it's important for all of us to understand the, the, the meaning of reparations? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. And it has been a long time. Uh, I keep getting emails. I haven't, uh, uh, so I stay in touch with all the work you're doing, fabulous work. Um, reparations is something I got involved with in the early 80s. I was working as an attorney with the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division uh, called Special Litigation Section that dealt with the issues of prisons, the rights of the institutionalized prisons, mental health institutions. And I was, it was on 9th in Pennsylvania. The, the office was on 9th, between 9th and 10th in Constitution Avenue in Pennsylvania. And I was walking back uh, from, I think, lunch. I'm not quite sure. And I, this poster was up by ANRA, which is African National Reparations Organization back then. I'm not sure if it's still in existence. I think it might be. And they had this big poster with the picture of Uncle Sam, you know, that traditional picture with the top hat and suit, and had pointed out at, at me and saying, at whoever, and saying, Black people, Uncle Sam owes you so many trillions of dollars. And it just, I like said, yes, <laughs> they do. <know. laughs> and I began to get involved. I was with some friends, I worked with some friends who were in more of the nationalist community, uh, the, rep uh, the RNA, the Republic of New Africa, New African People's Organization, and other groups. And they had long had uh, a platform around reparations. Uh, some people may have heard of uh, Queen Mother Audley Moore back in the, you know, uh, she was very instrumental in, in the reparations movement and campaign. So I became involved because it resonated with me. Although, you know, I, I was, I would say, a semi student of, of Black history, not a major student. I'm not, I wasn't a scholar of it or anything, but I knew about our history. I knew about the history of slavery, the, uh, the transatlantic in quote, slave trade, uh, trade in quotes. Uh, uh, and you know the, the the rape of Africa for their bodies, uh, uh, and so I knew some of that, but it just it came together for me that there was a debt owed, uh, and the debt was a debt that uh, needed to be addressed, and some groups were already addressing it. Uh, but uh, it was more at that point really lodged in what we call the nationalist community, uh, which was a narrower community even as it relates to black people, right? Uh, and so I became involved, long story shorter at least, uh, we, uh, I, t I was uh, very active in the, and I think I might have been uh, chair of a uh, co-chair of the National Conference of Black Lawyers uh, at that time of the criminal punishment or criminal justice section, uh, eventually became its director. Uh, and uh, I brought the issue to the black lawyers and we sped faster. We had a forum in 87 biennial of the constitution in which the topic was what would the constitution have been like it if it addressed the issues of black people. I organized a, for a session on reparations and well, I guess the I, I, we started working, we formed what's called the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America in 87. Out of that conference, I mentioned that the NCBL had, National Council of Black Lawyers had in 87. 
Uh, it was called, the interesting point here, it gives you the intersection of gender bias and gender issues too. The, one of the leaders of reparations group that had been a leader in the reparations movement for a number of years, uh, uh, Dorothy Benton Lewis, who has now made her transition, she asked what, the black male leader, who was very much a leader in, in the reparations movement too, Mario Bedelli, if he would issue the call for the formation of a group that was just focused on reparations. Her thought being, and I spoke with her about this, she was a good friend of mine, after the fact, after I learned about it, was that they would listen to him. They may not listen to her. So we yeah. see how a lot of these isms, sexism, chauvinism, all of this is interrelated in all of our movements. And so it, became, we formed the organization. We had several organizing meetings starting off here in DC, in the DC area, in DC really at a trade union and then in other areas. Formed it, uh, one of our members was very active in the uh, politics in, in Detroit. Reparations Ray, we call him, Ray Jenkins. And he lobbied Congressman Conyers to death. He just kept lobbying him and lobbying him. And finally, Congressman Conyers agreed to introduce a bill uh, for reparations, which initially wasn't HR 40, it was HR 37 something or other, because the number had been given out 40. So the first bill for reparations wasn't HR 40. Your, some of your viewers and participants of the webinar may not realize that 40 is significant because it's 40 acres and a mule. And that's what uh, we were promised by uh, General Sherman uh, in uh, 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 eight during the Civil War, and he promised 40 acres and a mule. He actually promised 40 acres. I can't find any mention of the mule, but somebody added the mule later. But he did offer and gave. Some Black people did get the 40 acres from uh, plantation owners that they took the land from during the Civil War. But then after the war, look what happened. They gave the land back to them, which meant that they took the land from the Black people they had given it to. So... Uh, but anyway, he introduced this bill, and the significant thing for today is this is the first time the Judiciary Committee is marking it up in order to pass it out of committee. So it's very significant. We have been working on this. He introduced it in 1989. Uh, it has been amended once. It was initially a study bill of whether or not uh, there were reparations old, and if so, what. Uh, it now it was amended in 2017 before he left Congress. Uh, he amended it to be a study bill of what reparations are owed, not whether, but of what. So that was a significant uh, amendment. Uh, and then Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, when 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 Congressman Conyers left the the House in 2018, I believe 2017 2018, she has taken it up and has done a magnificent job of pushing it forward to where we are now in this historic moment. Uh, why is what is reparations and why is it important? I can do a, a little short piece on that if any of your uh, listeners and viewers are interested. There are all kinds of resources, and you can be more I can be more than happy if someone's sincerely interested in it for you to give them my contact information. Uh, but reparations is a legal term, and it is some, it's not new. Some people think, oh, this is just new. No. Reparations is a term that says that it's a repair for an injustice. Sometimes it's used in individual terminology and in some, call, how, how, you know, what reparation should we give this individual? Most particularly it's used when you're talking about the injury that is done by a government to a group, a group of people, whatever. So we have, for example, reparations were given uh, in uh, South Africa, uh, uh, you know, you know, many of us argue and quarrel that it was insufficient, but it was given to uh, those who were specific injured by the white state, uh, the uh, uh, white apartheid state, white, apart white apartheid state. Uh, so reparations were given to uh, some uh, Latin American countries uh, for uh, remember the disappeared. 
uh, and those kinds of things. So there's it's it's really a concept of a group concept. And so reparations, uh, in, in the sense for African descendants, I call it, uh, or some people use African descendants, some people in the movement use just Africans, some people use African Americans. But we're talking about the injury done in this specific sense, not to Africa, but to those who were stolen from Africa, and they were stolen, uh, and uh, and from the Middle Passage and landed here. We're looking at the United States. We know also went to Britain and other places that Britain uh, controlled um, for the injury done. And one of the things that I did, I led, uh, 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 I was the first co-chair of, of INCOBA, the National Coalition of Blacks Reparation in America. And when I stepped down from that, I formed the Legal Strategies Commission. And we developed five injury areas. Now this doesn't mean these are the only injury areas, but the five injury areas for which reparations are owed uh, from the INCOBA platform are wealth and poverty, the stealing of wealth, the wealth disparities, uh, between whites and blacks uh, that didn't just come up because white, you know, but whites are better with money than blacks. That's that's a myth. We know that uh, that we have the gap. We have health, which would include mental health as well. Uh, and we all have, and, and I know we talked a little bit earlier about the COVID and the disparities and the illness. You know, there are many instances of disparities in health. And there are many instances to show, NIH did a study once on uh, um, the of heart illnesses in women. And uh, there was a major disparity between health, health, heart health for blacks and for whites black women and white women. There's studies showing that, for example, with the HIV and AIDS, much of the medicines that were, and I don't know if it's, they've changed it and updated it in more recent years, but they were actually, when you do those studies, you, you, you find out protocols and stuff, but they were done with primarily whites, you know, if not a, all whites. The studies that have been done in the, on, on COVID the National Medical Association says this is the first time there's ever been a major medical study, and I'm and I know I'm not using the right word, uh, 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 Jim, for what they do, but when they they look at these groups and they they test it out, so that this was the first time a significant, statistically significant number of blacks were included. You know, they haven't been included in other studies on all the other major illnesses. Uh, and so to see if how, you know, so those things. We also, so it's health, uh, we, criminal punishment. We call it punishment because it's not justice. It's not a justice system in the United States. You know, everybody thinks that the criminal justice system is really a justice system, doesn't know the data on, the, on what it does. So, but that was one of the major areas. Uh, peoplehood nationhood, which was when we were stolen from Africa, our own peoplehood was stripped. What does that mean? I'll give one example. One example is when people were boarding the ships, were forced to board these ships, they were separated from their people who they were uh, uh, native tribes and, and that kind of thing. They even did that in the uh, when they were put in these so-called castles, which were actually dungeons, uh, so that I no longer was sitting next to my tribe's person, you know, uh, I, I couldn't converse. They also denied us the use of language. You know, we could not speak in our languages, you know, they separated us, but then they denied us that, peoplehood, nationhood. And I'm, th I'm blanking on one and I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. So those are the things that reparations are owed for. Uh, I don't know if you have a question. I don't, because I don't you know. I, I, I have a thought and a question, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that kind of overview. And the thought is that I, it seems to me that one of the reasons that we are paying attention now to many things, including reparations, is because of what the pandemic has exposed. Mm -hmm. And in this instance, we're talking about the incredible health inequities between mm -hmm. people of color and, and white people, and yeah. especially the very dramatic difference in death rates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. every, we were just talking about a friend who, who died recently and wondering if she had had COVID. There is no adult black person I know 
who hasn't lost friends and or family mm -hmm. during this time. And I think it's a combination because I know you wanted to talk about the policing, but I think it's a combination. This year we had COVID and we had George Floyd. Right. Uh, now, many of us know and that know some of this background. The George Floyd was not the first black man killed by the police. You know, unarmed black man killed by the police, and there are unarmed black women who have been killed by the police. We also know about Breonna Taylor. This year was significant because we had Breonna Taylor, we had George Floyd, and we had Aubrey Alper, the, the guy, the young man in Georgia. So we had that in COVID. All of this is in our face, you know, and for some, I would call it, I call it, and, and, and I don't mean it to be offensive, but I call them well-meaning white folk who hadn't woke up yet, but are well-meaning. This was a wake-up call. This wasn't a wake-up call for black folk. We've been knowing that. My mom and daddy knew that, yeah. you know, but it was a wake-up call for well-meaning white folk who were willing to take the shades off, who was willing to stop what I used to, when I taught, tell my students, and they laugh at me because I said they who were willing to realize that they had drunk the juice. They had, they had imbibed the lies of this country. Mm -hmm. They had bought the lies that are told by people who want to justify racism. Black people just don't work hard enough. You know, black people's diet is such that that's why they dine more than white folk, right? Uh, well, maybe if that black man hadn't looked threatening, the police wouldn't have killed him. Maybe if he or she hadn't run, the police wouldn't have killed him. Now, how many white folk do you know that have run from the police that don't get shot to death, who get shot in the leg? They know how to, they know how to stop people without killing them, except mm -hmm. for black people. So I think that this, it all combined. I do. I think it all combined. And I think that that's why you're getting more and more groups who are signing up saying we support HR 40. You know, we want you to pass it. What does HR 40 do? It doesn't just automatically give reparations. It's modeled after the Japanese American bill, right? And it sets up a commission and the members of the commission are selected both by the, the, uh, I think it's the Speaker of the House, activist reparations groups, uh, it's several government groups and activist groups that have been working on this issue. And that commission then would take testimony. So this isn't just the, oh, okay, fine, you know, here's a check. The other thing is that people have, I think, I know, uh, a misunderstanding is, and Dorothy, the woman I spoke about earlier, who actually issued the call but didn't because she thought a man would do it better, a leader man, uh, said reparations is more than a check. When people, you know, reparations isn't just writing a check to black folk or trying to discern what black folk would get a check because of their legacy of, of being connected to slavery. And I, what we argue the legacy of slavery. Reparations is, and you, you, we kind of talked about this without saying reparations. Let's examine the institutions that have embedded within them uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 racism, institutional racism. You know, Manny Marable, who is now deceased, wrote a book and Art talked about. He's, he was a professor at Columbia, I think, an activist. He he talked about institutionalized racism, how racism now has become embedded in the very fibers of our institutions. It started out as a individual group kind of structure back in 1619, which is the first uh people say or the, when the first Af enslaved Africans were brought to the United States, but it was institutionalized. When slavery was institutionalized in the law, many other things became institutionalized. Now you see today that many of our systems are institutionalized racism. There's studies that show the difference in terms of how blacks and whites are treated. So how, that's very, very helpful, very important. And I agree with you completely. It is a confluence of factors now that are weak. Mm -hmm well-meaning white people and sometimes people who are not so well-meaning are also having to look at the facts and i think that's very that that's very important powerful process what does it mean and this may sound like a dopey question mm -mm. why are reparations important why are they important to you why are they important to black people why are they important to all of us 
And that's not, not a dopey question at all. I used to tell my students, first of all, there's no dopey question. If you have the question, ask it. I used to always be the one to ask it. And the students well, I don't expect a dopey answer from yeah. You. Yeah. yeah, the students come up to me and say, oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. I was thinking the same thing. Anyway, um, that's a great question. And I think that goes to your in our initial discussion about mind, body, spirituality, uh, we didn't quite get there to talk about healing. How do you heal? You see, um, you if in fact this country, and we know it's not going to be every single person, so we're talking about the majority, wants to heal the racial divide. We must acknowledge, we must, of the history of this country, we must acknowledge as it relates to the African descendant people, the injury that was done by this country. We have to stop hiding behind, well, you know, uh, my mom and daddy or my grandfather, or my, I, we didn't own slaves. We didn't own, in, we didn't own people uh, that was allowed. And it's also like, we have to recognize what the injury is in that regard, you know? No, but you live in a country that did and you benefited. I had a student, I told, I taught a class yesterday at Georgia Tech uh, by Zoom on reparations. And one of the things that we talked about, what, is the, what are some of the arguments? That's one. I, my family did not, did not participate in slavery. We did not have a plantation or a farm or anything where in, in human beings were owned by black black human beings were owned by my family. That's one. Uh, the uh, other argument is well, that was then, and that's this is now. So we mm -hmm. deny the overcasting injury. So it seems to me that all of those are defenses. They're not really looking at the history straight on and realizing and accepting the fact that that injury was done by largely white, well, the government was white, you know, people say, oh, well, some black people own slaves. Well, you know, they may have had one person and not, and no significant number, right? We're, you know, you pull out little facts to try and help your argument of the hundred families that own, say, and I'm using, I don't, I'm not saying that's accurate, so don't write down folks that it was a hundred people that owned, try, you know, legally owned, you know, Black people, there may have been one at most. It might have even been a larger percentage. So don't pull out a little fat to then try and defeat. That's what people do. That's defensive. Healing. If we're gonna, if we're gonna get past the George Floyd's, the Breonna Taylors, the disparities in the death rates from health, the disparities in wealth that we know are not just because black folks aren't just aren't good at money, but they were denied their wealth, you know, if and continue to be not just in slavery. You know, we talk about the GI Bill, how it was discriminatorily, you know, applied. Mm -hmm. Black people, black GIs <laughs> couldn't go and buy the same property that white GIs could go and buy. The FHA was discriminatory right? All of this. So healing is needed. And how do you heal? Acknowledge it. Stop making defenses about it. Stop, you know, saying it wasn't me or whatever. Stop using defenses. Acknowledge it. And then look honestly at what is the current day injury. And let's look and discuss with experts. How do you heal that? How your field, Jim, in, in mind, body, you know, and, and, you know, I always, you know, I thought you were, fa I think you're fabulous because you can, you do all, you know, you, you would, when you treat, you do the acupuncture, then you do the, you know, the various, you know, Chinese herbs and stuff, but you don't shy away from traditional medicine if you feel that is the better approach for this person. So we need experts who are well-meaning, who are honest, who are going to look at and say, okay, in the area of mental health, in the area of physical health, health in general. What are the injuries? And how do we fix that? How do we close that? How do we address that? Does that mean that uh, in health, that we need to develop a better health care system, insurance? Maybe we have to make sure, I, I, mean, I believe in health health, and health care for all anyway. I mean, so you know, maybe it wouldn't be just that. So then that's how we get there. Because then we're having an honest conversation about healing, 
about closing. And, and the other area that I didn't mention was education. You know, so that becomes a healing for the whole country. So what what do you think um, the nature, because we're talking about uh, a healing, a repairing of it, objective injustices in these various systems. What about the internal process? What, what, from your point of view, what do you think reparations and truly addressing reparations will do for black people, for white people, for the whole country, for our consciousness, for who we are as humans? I look at it like, um, and I think everybody may have experienced this because I, I try when I taught, I tried to do things on the down and the nitty gritty. I did that yesterday with the students. So have you ever think about a time when you, when an injury was done you uh, by whoever, when you were a child, as an adult, whoever, and that person who was responsible for the injury and you can put yourself in both situations. You can be the injured and you can be the person who was doing the injury, right? It comes with a genuine statement of, I know I did this. I am responsible. I regret that I did this. And this is what I am going to do. I regret that I stole your toy. I took your toy. You might not even want to use the word stuff. I regret that I took your toy. It was wrong for me to take your toy. And here is your toy back, right? How does that make you feel as the person who had the toy taken? And I'm, I'm really putting it on the basic level. But how does that make you feel as a person who maybe the mama told you or daddy told you better go? Da, 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 da. But how does it make you feel once you've done that? So to me, it lifts both people. It lifts both people. This is not just simply to lift African descendant people. This is to lift everybody. This is to say we have acknowledged that in our history as the United States of America and before then as the colonies, we did this harm. And we acknowledge that we continued it despite, in quotes, emancipation. And I say in quotes because there's some data that shows that all Africans were not freed by the, you know, and post the, we're getting ready to celebrate Juneteenth again. That was two years after the so-called Civil War was over that Africans enslaved in uh, Texas found out they were free, right. so-called free. So, but then we also know up and there were people who were enslaved, black people who were enslaved up until the 1950s. Not a significant number like we're talking about in, you know, the formal slavery. So say a little more about what, what you think it will do psychologically, ethically, spiritually. You're, 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 I think what, it's very important. And I want to emphasize while you're thinking about that for a moment, for people who are watching us, so it's a beautiful thought experiment that you suggested to use your imagination to imagine yourself uh, essentially making reparations for a wrong you have done to someone else and someone else doing it toward you. I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a, again, it's a tool of mind-body medicine. We do this with our forgiveness meditation, mm -hmm. right? We ask somebody, we imagine somebody to, uh, to whom we've done something wrong and asking their forgiveness. We imagine uh, asking uh, them, <laughs> we imagine forgiving them for something they've done to us. And then we have to imagine this final part, forgiving ourselves, mm -hmm. which is also not so easy. And I think that's one of the reasons why some of these concepts are so hard, that people are stuck. They, they, they don't want to admit that they've done something, they've done something wrong, and they don't have they're not, they're neither compassionate toward the person they've done something wrong to, that is, in this instance, people of African descent, nor to themselves. Yeah. And I, I feel that so much that these are these are people who've hardened themselves against the other, but also against their own best selves. Mm -hmm. I think, Jim, that some people, and, and I, if, if I'm taking 
on a lead you don't need to go. I actually think, and this is not from, I mean, you know, I have background in psychiatry, social work, but nowhere near your background in psychiatry and all of that. So I'm not trying to say I do. But in my life, I've met people that just, they cannot admit their error. They, they couch it in so many different ways. They It's almost like they feel like they're less than if they say that, that that would, and it, it, it may be a form of insecurity and they're afraid to admit that they were wrong or they did something wrong. You know, uh, I just, I mean, I see it every day. You know, I, you know, people are defensive, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I made that mistake. It could be even something little. I mean, it doesn't even have to be anything major. So I think that there's some, some people are just, we need to rewire ourselves. We need to recognize that human beings make errors, you know, and some of the errors are small and some of them are large. We also have to realize that many people have bought the lie, drunk the juice, that somehow it's okay to exploit and oppress other people mm -hmm. for a goal. Some people rationalize slavery. How do you rationalize stealing by arms people and throwing them on ships, putting them in, and, and if you haven't seen these slave ships, look, go, you have to Google them. You don't even have to go anymore anywhere to a museum. Imagine people stacked up like sardines. I just ate a can of sardines. That ain't fun. You know, if you imagine how people are, were stacked up, how do you rationalize that? The only way to rationalize it is to say they weren't human or they aren't human because mm -hmm. it weren't a weren't for some people, it still is. That's why they can do, Chauvin could do what he did to George Floyd. And he's just an example because he didn't view George Floyd as human. How do you put your knee on somebody's neck, subdue them? You got nine million cops circling, circling around you and you still feel he's a threat? And you keep it on until he, the doctor that testified said, he kept his knee on that man's neck until he was not able to breathe. How do you do that? How do you justify that? And I'm asking, everybody, not just white people. I'm saying, think about that. Those people who are trying to justify the murders of black people that have occurred through policing. How do you justify that? How do you justify that you can explain away the violence done by white people, but you can't explain away violence done by black people? So I'm not painting black people as always innocent. But there are bad, in quotes, bad people or people who do bad things, maybe not bad people. In every race, so-called, because we know race is a social construct where some white people don't want to hear, some black people don't want to hear. When I first heard, I'm like, oh, no, because you're holding on to race. How do we how do we justify that? When I think what you're, what you're saying, this is, I just want to emphasize what you the point that you made is that it's generally at some level, whether conscious or unconscious, justified by saying they're not human. Exactly. They're not, exactly. They're not human. Yeah. Or and they're not as human as I am. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And that, that is, you know, that is part of where this country started, of course, with its treatment of indigenous. Basically, yeah. And continued with slavery. But, and that is also the, what, the basic point of view, if you will, of Nazi Germany, of any of the genocides, is that those others are not human, or as you say, not as human as we are. So how this is what we're working with now. We're working both, you've been working on sort of, you know, the sort of, uh, sort of policy side of what reparations means, but I know you're also deeply concerned with psychological and mm -hmm. spiritual side, how do we help people come to that place of, from your point of view of seeing, being able to see the humanity of the other? One of the things that I said some years ago, I was speaking at the Missouri Association of Social Workers. I was asked to speak uh, on reparations. This is many years ago. And, um, one of the things I said then, and I, I've said it since then, but I really believe to this day is important, is we have to listen 
to each other's stories. And I mean, really listen. And we have to keep our feet in the room. We cannot operate on you saying something I don't want to hear, so I'm going to leave. And that's everybody has to. That's not just white people have to stay and listen to my story. I have to stay and listen to theirs. I have to listen. And I have to listen. I don't mean, you know, I took a course, and many of us have done this in communication. You know how you take these little courses. And they talk about when you really are listening, when you're really communicating, stop. You're listening, but you're listening, developing your argument as the person speaks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. You aren't listening, right? Well, when they finish, I'm going to say, blah, 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 right? That's not listening. That's being defensive. That's saying, I don't agree with what he's saying or she's saying, even though you're not really hearing what he or she is saying. And I, this is what I'm going to say. This is why I'm going to reply. We have to listen. And that doesn't mean, I mean, if I'm listening to the, uh, the, uh, and I have talked with uh, descendants of, of, of white people who enslaved Africans, I was, had a relationship, uh, p political, not, not uh, uh, personal with, and I'm blanking on her name right now, but the family in Rhode Island that was the big ship owner family that had built the ships that went out and owned the ships that went to Africa, right? And all of that family became very much involved in the movement for reparations and for, you know, making, you know, making amends, so to speak. Then another part of the family wasn't, right? Uh, but you have to listen. You have to sit and listen. You have to, you can't, even the part of the family that was very much involved in really working for reparations and trying to, educate their family as to why what happened was wrong. We are taking the benefit of the rape and murders of people for our own person. The, the really listening, I, I want to say a couple words about what, what our work does, and I want to hear your thoughts about how to promote listening on a broader scale. What our model is, and when we train people, we may have 200 people in a training, and we have 20 small groups, and uh, in those groups, so there are 10 people in the group with one of our faculty members, and they're learning the mind-body techniques, they're learning different forms of meditation and self-expression and words, drawings and movement and guided imagery, and they're listening to each other. And the first rule, we start with a meditation so people get in a more relaxed place so that they're not ready with their argument right away. <laughs> just And then the first rule is when somebody else is speaking, shut up, mm -hmm. listen, listen with your whole being. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to who that person is mm -hmm. and pay attention to what comes up inside you. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding, and uh, our trainings are very mixed. I mean, the next we have a training coming up in a couple of days. We have, I think, 50 Native Americans, and I don't know how many African Americans, it's all mixed, sort of all different people. And people are saying, this is the first time I've ever been in a room for any length of time with a person of that other color. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes with Indians, it's with a person of that other tribe. And so, and I never, I never thought it was possible to actually be there and, and to understand them. But I have a different kind of understanding. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we do that and we give time to that. And that's a cardinal rule of our trainings and the work we do mm -hmm. in communities all over the United States and all mm -hmm. over the world. But how do we bring that model and what you're saying about listening in, into the larger public world in, in which we live? Well, I think we have to do it little by little. I don't think, I mean, the African proverb, how do you eat an ele elephant? One bite at a time, right? And so I think that's the way, I mean, I, I think we want it to be real big. We want it to be the majority that we reach. And, and But we, we reach the majority by reaching groups like you're working on and spreading it more and more. And then people begin to expand it. Uh, you know, reaching out to, uh, you know, many organizations and government uh, uh, departments and others have these, you know, these in-service training or little 
conferences begin to, you know, we need to spread more of that within them. If somebody hears of a conference, oh, maybe we'll have a, can we get an, an in that? Many times we're invited. I mean, I say we, I mean, I'm sure you're invited uh, to give a workshop in various means. I think we have to do it little at a time or not little at a time, but we have to know that we can't do it we can't educate the whole United States in one big forum, right? So how do you do it? Educating in smaller forums. The other thing is, I think, and I know you do, uh, you do a lot of this. Uh, I think we need to write more about it. I think we need to be on. You were on a program on Sunday, I saw, and I didn't get to look at it, but we need to start figuring out how do we sneak these little things in in any of our forum. I, I did it yesterday with the students. How do you how do you convince a well-meaning white person to support reparations? And you know, people want to go to this big argument and this one student had this whole right, history of da-da-da-da-da and da-da-da-da, you know, greed and uh uh And when she finished, I said, but you didn't answer my question. Because you're right. That whole thing you laid out for the most part, I don't look, disagree with, but that's not gonna convince anybody. Because you're attacking them, even though you think you're not attacking them, you know. How do you do it? How do you? How do you? So I do think that we have to incorporate more what you you do as your, you know, life's work, within other kinds of structures. So it's not so it's not like special. You got to come to the you know your center. But as we talk, as as we you know. I do it, you know, how, maybe I need to learn more mm -hmm. how to do that so I can do it better, whatever. The other thing I think is important, Jim, is I've learned here, I'm, I moved into a retirement community. It's about, it's, it's still growing, it's a building, it's just a little more than a year old. Uh, so it's not even full capacity yet. And I think maybe a little about 30% or so of the people are black. And we have one woman that's from Argentina, uh, so that's so Latin, Latinx, and then uh, the rest are in quotes white, right? And uh, I'm gonna give you one example. I uh, had, we were friendly. This white woman and I, I call her white. I always do now since I learned about the social construct. I was, you know, <laughs> in quotes white, you know, because the data shows that you and I have more in common than we have difference. If you're looking at, you know, opening our bodies up. I mean, I'm not just talking about culture. I'm talking about physiology, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, and this woman and I have become friendly first week or so I was here. Uh, one woman, white woman asked me if I wanted to, did I play bridge? Yeah, I play bridge. So I'm now playing bridge. And that's the woman that I'm going to tell you the little short story about is part of the bridge club. We walk, we walk. She's a walker. She's 92 years old. And we are in the walking club, me and her. Right, we're the walking club, <laughs> and so we walk. Well, we were sitting at at dinner. We had all uh, dinner is lunch here, and I was talking, and I forgot, I forgot the adage that you don't talk politics and you don't talk religion, right? Especially with people you do not know. And I said, I don't know how the topic came up. This was my error. I told the manager, this is my fault. And I said, I think that if President Trump had just taken COVID more seriously when he first heard about it, we wouldn't have as many deaths. Well, I didn't know this was a Trump. Mm -hmm. Boy, she just like went in. The point is, I said to her after she finished telling me a whole bunch of stuff, half of which weren't true, but that's all right. I didn't even challenge her untrue facts. I said, if we are going to be friends, so I didn't even back off on our relationship. You have to listen. Mm -hmm. You can't just point at me and lecture me. And we walk now. Now we haven't talked about politics since then, but we walk and da 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 da, da right? But I'm not gonna, my friends, how can you be with her? She's a Trumper. Well, you know, she somebody else said, how can you be with her? She's a leftist, you know? But I think that's part of it. I do, I think that's, and I know it sounds silly, but it's a one-on-one. -on -one. And, and I think we have to be brave enough, courageous enough to raise with people who are on the other side of the fence from us and whatever the topic is, listen to me and I'll listen to you. 
but we can't be afraid. Like I correct this, I didn't correct her facts with another person. I won't go because we don't have time. Another person made a, a statement about Martin Luther King, which was half untrue. And I told him we were in a conversation. He wanted my help. And after we finished, I didn't stop talking. I said, but I do resent and think you were incorrect in raising these things about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King wasn't even part of our discussion. Why is it the white people think somehow they, to attack, they can just attack black people and, and, and spew all this information, most of which is a lie. And, and I'm supposed to back off and say, oh, okay, you know, so, and I think that's part of the conversation. Thank you. I, I think, Aju, I think those we're going to make the last words. We have to listen to other people. <laughs> we want them to listen to us. And also, I would add, and I think you're a wonderful example, we need to listen to our inner promptings. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you've cultivated a meditative practice mm -hmm. of years. So you need to listen and you need to respond rather than react and be fully present mm -hmm. people and that's that's one of the ways to sort of keep the door open as we're saying and to to move things ahead and one of the aspects of of reparations we also need to repair the way we relate to each other and that's part of reparations because if if you're going to do reparations right then it it will repair relationships we're going to have to come to a close thank now. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's good. It's good to listen to you. It's good to be with you, to talk to you, to see you. And um, I'm looking forward to it being a little sooner next time, too. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. We're going to sit for a minute and do a little soft belly breathing, and then we'll close the session. And uh, I'll be thanking you again after we breathe together for another minute or so. So that's everyone, just relax. Oh, you may want to take some time in the future to listen to this, to watch us again, and to, to listen to what Ajua has had to say, what she shared with us during this time. We're breathing deeply for now, just relaxing. As faults come, let them come, notice them, let them go. Gently bring your mind back to soft belly. Just a couple more slow, deep, soft belly breaths. Let's open our eyes, let our attention come back in the room to the screen. So thank you, everyone. And Ajua, thank you so much, dear. Okay. It's so great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you, too. You look good, too, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. you. Yep. Well, it's it's keeping up with, with the work, keeping up with what we're doing, I think, that keeps us looking however good we look. <laughs> yeah. As we age, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye-bye for now.